Welcome to LFPL's At the Library series, an ongoing podcast featuring author talks, programs, and events at the Louisville Free Public Library. For more information about upcoming events, visit us online at www.lfpl.org forward slash upcoming events dot htm. Thank you so much. And it is an honor and a privilege for me to be able to have the opportunity to be with you this evening. Just want to give you a little brief thing as we move forward. As with Juneteenth, there are many stories about black history that have been hidden for years and years and they remain unknown to many of us today. So as Juneteenth Commission works to shed light on our past, Tonight's author has been working so hard uncovering and telling his own fascinating and inspiring uh, and paradigm, paradigm shifting, I should say as well, uh, stories of black history, both through his top rated podcast. So tonight we're looking at the Humanity Archive and now his new book, and he's going to share his story. But I just want to say this about um, Juneteenth and our history. You know, our theme has been for the past two years, our story, America's glory. And we chose that theme because as African-Americans, as blacks here in these United States, we built it. Whether it's said or not, we built it. And we may as well own up to it. Thank you so much for that. So one of the things that we have been very charged to try to do is to make sure that our children are being taught our history and that it's not just taught once a year during the month of February, the shortest year, the shortest month of the year, I might add, uh, but it is taught continually because without that, the history is not going to go on and live on. So I am excited to be able to introduce tonight uh, in his sharing of the knowledge with us, this young man right here in our own Louisville Free Public Library. So would you put your hands together and please welcome Louisville's own Jermaine Fowler and along with him, conversation with WLKY anchor, Carrie Grace. Welcome them to the stage. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Making sure our audio is good. Welcome. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I think uh, we're most excited, obviously, to see Jermaine and to talk about your book. Everybody, just congratulate him on this book launch. Thank you. Appreciate it. And I am sure it's like birthing a child of sorts, right? Yeah, yeah. It took a long time to uh, conceive of the book, to write the book, um, and to see it come out into the world is like, you know, it's like looking at your baby come out. I want to give it a book birthday and like get a birthday (laughs) cake for my book, right? So uh, I'm just very excited to see people sharing it, sharing pictures of it, and then just coming out into the world. Yeah, that's what we're doing. And I was celebrating uh, the book that I was lucky enough to get my hands on a while ago, so... Uh, Thank you for that. And you said, you know, it's like celebrating something you've worked on so long. And I want to say you said you've been writing this book your entire life. Yeah, this uh, it's kind of an emotional moment for me because the book started here in this very library. I came here as a kid because in my history classes, I didn't see black people represented. So I caught the bus out here, the Tark bus, and I went up to when the, the books were on the, the second floor, I think it was up there, and I just like lost myself in the shelves of this very library. I read my way, I walked into the library and read my way out of this library, um, just finding my history, finding black history, and then that led me into human history as well. So it started with, uh, I heard a story of Rosa Parks in school, and it was very narrow, 
They didn't really tell much about her, and I knew there was more to the story, so I wanted to go find more. So that was like the first book that kind of started me on my journey to discovery of black history. So, uh, you know, it was a pretty emotional moment to be here right now where it all began. Yeah, so fitting that we are here in this library tonight. Uh, let's just start with the title of the book, The Humanity Archive, Recovering the Soul of Black History from a Whitewashed American Myth. When did you know that's what you were going to title the book? I think there was two parts to the title, uh, The Humanity Archive. I already had a podcast mm -hmm. and a whole platform that was a, the basis of the platform was The Humanity Archive to tell the stories of the historically unheard to tell the stories of the overlooked, the stories of the marginalized. So the book is actually an offshoot of that. But as far as, you know, the second part of the title, you know, recovering the soul of black history. Well, I think for me, it's, you know, I'm looking for humanity in all the stories I tell. What are those existential things that connect us all, right? We all smile, we all cry, we all um, love music, right? So I, I don't think Black history is often told in that way of connecting to black humanity. So I, I wanted to recover, like, what is the soul of black history? You know, what does that look like? What does it mean to be human? Uh, why are we told such a narrow black history? And then the whitewashed American myth, I mean, history has been whitewashed. It has been erased. Black history for years, they said slavery was benign. Uh, for years, they relegated black history to the margins. I mean, if you go into a bookstore, it's still relegated to the margins. Black history is separated and segregated off into another section. Um, there's African-American studies departments at colleges. That's for a reason, because they had to be there to uh, incorporate the stories, but they're still not really incorporated into the whole of American history. So since black history is part of the fabric of America, I, I wanted to make sure that that was included and, and see how I could tie all that together. Well, you do a beautiful job in the book of it. You bring in so many stories. Uh, I love how you just give us so much. I feel like the book penetrated my soul, the words, just because you talk about these people that we do not learn about in school. Yeah. I mean, it's the last day of Black History Month. I have a daughter. She's in school. She's in first grade. And, you know, she learned about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Absolutely. She dressed up as Ruby Bridges today for school. But... You know, uh, we learn about Harriet Tubman, uh, but we go 12 years of school oftentimes, Absolutely. and we don't learn the names in this book. For those of you who just got it tonight, when you read it, you will learn about so many black Americans who, I mean, the contributions, as we know, uh, that they made to our society, to our nation, to our world, thank you for bringing them to light. I appreciate it. In, in the process of writing this book, where did you find those stories? Do you feel like you had to dig deep for them? I wanted to do it different than the podcast. I tell a lot of stories there, but I, I always feel like if you look for these stories, then you're going to find them. So I did have to dig deep far and wide to, to find, you know, these figures. Some figures in the book you all will know. And even with those figures, I wanted to tell their stories from a different angle that maybe you hadn't heard before, dig deeper into, you know, their stories. So um for 10 months, I was locked in, in a room right in my office, just, you know, I was surrounded by books. I still have a lot of the books, you know, that I researched from. And uh, I really wanted to put, put a focus on black scholars, too, and go to their books, you know, throughout time. There's a long history of black scholars who, you know, were excluded from academia, right, who might not have had degrees, but dug for this history and found it and brought it forward. So I just wanted to stand in the tradition of them uh, as one of those people who investigated, dug for the history, found it. So I, I highlight them in the story uh, and just so many black figures that, I think people will be like, wow, I can't believe I didn't know that. Yeah, I love that you, you humanize them and you, you sort of talk about some of the people we have heard of in a way that we've never heard. Um, but I think, well, I've highlighted a lot of names. I don't want to get too deep into that because then, you know, that would, <laughs> that would, that would take a long time, right? Um, but you said uh, that, actually, I'm going to go to the first, the first thing. In the prologue, you said, I fought to clear my mind of the lies degrading all things African, the lies that debase the intelligence, beauty, possibility, and capability of African-descended people. And then you said, in response, my whole worldview became black, and that made me gullible to conspiracies, half-truths, and questionable facts. Talk to me about when you do sort of, you go down this, this path, you, you can get tunnel vision of mm -hmm. sorts, and then you start to only look at things from a different lens. How did you get out of that when you do get so deep in realizing the truths that have been denied to us? 
Yeah, I think for that part of the book, I was really thinking about the idea of internalized racism. You know, as a kid, I mean, I, you all might have seen the, the doll test, right? Uh, Dr. Kenneth and Mamie Clark in the 1950s, where they held a, a black doll and a white doll up for uh, kids five and six years old, up to nine years old. And, uh, you know, the kids, the black kids, they chose the white doll mostly. So I think that, uh, you know, we don't always realize the ways that the messaging of black inferiority throughout history has penetrated into, uh, you know, the, the minds of black people. So for me, that was like extracting that out mm -hmm. and refining myself in the pride of uh, black history. You know, black history really did that for me to, uh, you know, dig through that and then just go through the pain of it all and then come out transformed and changed, you know, through that experience, uh, which mm -hmm. I talked about there. Right, right. Um, also, in going through my notes, because I want to make sure that I'm Reading the parts that yeah. I thought were so important in chapter one, you say denialism pollutes history, minimalizes acts of inhumanity, and stalls acts of reconciliation. How timely is it that we are currently seeing so many uh, bills being written across our nation, uh, and we are seeing movements of people wanting to ban books? We have people who don't want black authors and, we, and who don't want what some would consider to be um, abrasive versions of black history taught in schools. Yeah, I think that's uh, a continuation of what we've seen for a long time in the erasure. And, and I use the word denialism uh, and I use the word whitewashing because I want to go back to one story I told in the book, for instance, uh, about Robert Smalls uh, in South Carolina. I went and I found that Robert Smalls' uh, plaque, it's on the ground, surrounded by cigarette butts, and then you have this Confederate statue mm -hmm. that's lifted up yeah. to the heavens, right? But tying that into this, these current attempts, I think, when you talk about a Robert Smalls, when you talk about a James Baldwin, when you talk about a to Toni Morrison, and this tradition of either black people in history or black storytellers, you have to talk about race. You have to talk about white supremacy. That's what they were talking about, right? So we have to deal with that. We have to face that head on and face those truths. So. I think these bills are really coming out because people don't want to deal with that discomfort. They, they think kids can't handle it. They don't want white children to uh, learn these truths. So they're really shuddering and segregating and just uh, reducing the teaching of black history. And they want to keep it narrow. They want to keep it to the sanitized stories and the, uh, the feel good stories of Martin Luther King Wright and Rosa Parks and Frederick Douglass. Uh, and I have kids too. And they literally just told me today that they started like tomorrow going back to talking about George Washington, right? They did one project on someone of their yeah. choosing from black history and then tomorrow it's right back to yeah. black history being segregated. And, you know, that all just speaks to the same thing in terms of uh, only wanting to talk about a narrow black history, but then also not wanting to talk about the pain of black history, which I think is what, where these bills stem from and these banning yeah. of books. Yeah, it's, well, it's funny you bring that up. On the first day of Black History Month, my daughter came home and said, guess what today is? I said... I assumed that's what she was going to say. She said, Groundhog Day. <laughs> and I was like, oh, is that what you learned at school? Yeah. And she was like, mm -hmm, yeah, Groundhog Day. So, you know, I mean, that's, a, you know, that's an example. But, you know, don't get me wrong. Of course, throughout the month, there were more lessons taught. Um, but it was still, you know, your typical Harriet Tubman and uh, Rosa Parks and, and that kind of curriculum. You know, in reading this book, I would say that, how do I put this? This is an example of a book that I could see getting banned. Yeah, I think it could. Because, I mean, the stories that are being told in there are <laughs> I mean, some of the stories they don't want to. Yeah. And I, I want to bring up a point, too. The reason I pushed to have the book come out on February 28th is because I really wanted to send a message that black history doesn't end in February. Yeah. It's no expiration date, right? Absolutely. Um, you know, we're talking about black history. We're not talking about milk or, or something that expires. So I hope this book was a jumping off point for people to want to uh, go beyond February, like, Absolutely. you know, and, and just take their study beyond just this month. So uh, that was what I really wanted to do with that. And, you know, I bring up the point of I could, the reason I say I could see this as a, as a book that could potentially get banned is because some of the stories you tell are, are raw, uh, they're real, and they can feel harsh, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's important that in reading this, you look at this and you say, okay, this is the reality. This, this is historically accurate. This is what happened. Now let's go further. Let's do a deep dive. Let's learn more. And that is what this book provoked me to do, is Absolutely. to go beyond. 
So thank you for that. I appreciate because that. Because uh, now I have all these highlighted names that I want to do more research on yeah. and learn more about. Um, and when speaking about the suffering of black history, I purposefully named uh, one of the, not the chapter, the, um, the uh, part of the part three of the book, I think it was, I named it anti-black history because I wanted to highlight that uh, a lot of times what we talk about as black history is what was done to black people. So I wanted to highlight those who actually did the things to black people as opposed to um, saying that this was, you know, just only black history. We have to look at, you know, this legacy, right, of white supremacy, of racism, of, you know, this idea of the, the Tulsa race massacres of the world, for instance. Most people didn't learn about that until 2020. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really wanted to tell those stories and I wanted to dedicate like a, a whole part of the book to that. Mm -hmm. And telling them from a lived experience point of view, like what do the people see, what do they feel? I pull a lot of quotes from people who actually lived this history so that you could feel what they feel, felt and see what they saw. So uh, that's what I really try to do too, is bring a lived experience. I'm not just talking about history from some factual way or uh, you know, some detached kind of way. I really want to put right. the storytelling and the emotion to these uh, histories so that we can feel them and, and see what those people saw. Absolutely. You know, you also talked a lot about enslavement because that is, I think, for majority of uh, black Americans and really Americans in general, when we think of oppression, when we think of uh, black history, we think of enslavement, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And so is there anything in particular when you were writing about all of the, of the various stories of the people who were either enslaved mm -hmm. or helped after uh, they were freed, uh, tell me, is there any story that you didn't get to put in the book, but that was striking to you? Mm, that's a good question. That's a good question. Because, yeah, there's so many stories. And when I, when I talk about slavery for that, I really wanted to highlight resistance to slavery. I have this saying that I like to say, if someone is teaching you about the history of slavery and they're not teaching you about resistance to slavery, yeah. they shouldn't be teaching you about slavery because, yeah, um, I think I highlighted you know, there's so <laughs> many, there's so many uh, stories. I mean, I really like the nameless, faceless. I mean, I think about the people who are like breaking tools and the people who were just trying to regain some power in their, their everyday yes. lives. So, um, you know, there's some stories of, of black women even enslaved and there aren't, I don't think there's any accounts of black women on the Middle Passage because they didn't write their stories down. So I really wanted to find like who was that mm -hmm. black woman on the Middle Passage, the stories that we didn't hear. So, um, you know, I wouldn't say there's one particular story that didn't make it in the book. It's just things like that that I'm always searching for to highlight the overlooked and to hi highlight the marginalized in, in history. Right, and, and I'm, I'm happy you brought up that point, and I was looking for it. I just have so many highlighted uh, the point about resistance because that was a really, I had to read that over. And, you know, that one of the things I want to highlight about the book in general is how many times I reread things because you have to, I kind of felt like I needed to digest them. And it took, a, it took a minute, right? So this is one of those books that I don't think you're going to speed read through. This is something that you're going to read. It's going to take a minute, you know, yeah. to just digest it and to internalize I mean, you might not internalize it, but, you know, if you want to, that's not necessarily a bad thing either. Mm -hmm. um, and it's what was, what, let's, let's go there. What is your overall goal of the book? I want people to, to see a mirror when they, when they look in this book, I want them to see a mirror to their own humanity. You know, I, I want to, I mean, I wrote this book for myself as, as a kid looking for my own humanity in, in a book and I didn't find it. So I wrote this book for like my younger self, you know, the young black kid who came to this library looking for my own humanity um, and not, not seeing it, you know, in my textbooks. And, uh, you know, I got a lot of history from my parents. Uh, so I, I, you know, I thank them for that. But um, in terms of just overall, like I, I, I wrote the book that I didn't see, you know, uh, to, to try to tie all these things together, the particulars of the black experience to the universal. I think about um, Carter G. Woodson, the father of black history, he said we shouldn't study black history, we should study black people in history. So I wanted to take that message and really apply it in that book and carry his mission forward uh, with this work. Absolutely. And that's exactly what it feels like. It feels like you're reading the book you never had growing up. It may be a little over, um, you know, a child's head, yeah. obviously, so not something that a, a small child could read. But uh, thank you for writing it for us adults who are able to take it to, to digest it and to feel like we are learning things that we were maybe never given the opportunity to learn. Um, and obviously, it's so many stories compiled together 
uh, that you don't have to check out 29 books from the library. It's all compiled yeah. into one. Yeah, so. that was a goal of mine. Yeah. And uh, even if you, when you read through the book, sometimes I just put my sources like right in the yeah. actual reading of the book. And I, I really, again, try to highlight black scholars, those who came before me, those whose shoulders I stand on. So I think for me, I was like, if, if you only have one book that you read about black history, like I want this to be that book that's going to send you down these different journeys to other books and really get this holistic experience so you can learn just a complete black history just from this one book. And not only that, I even tell people in one of the chapters it's called A Search for Truth, like my methods, like how do I go about finding these stories? How do I go about finding truth in history? So, um, you know, because ultimately I, I'm going to tell you what I think in the book, but I, I don't just want to tell people what I think. I want to yes. kind of tell people, you know, how to think, you know, how I think at the same time so that they can find these stories for themselves and make mm -hmm. sense of them on their own beyond my book. Well, y'all think I'm being dramatic, but I really do believe this is like a one and done type book. You can read it and say, I am well versed in black history. <laughs> no, I mean, but, but I mean, obviously I would, I would suggest you to always keep learning. And I think you talk about that in mm -hmm. here to never stop learning. Absolutely. Um, to be a lifelong learner, which is why uh, books like this are so important because we never need to stop digging for the truth, which brings me to the next idea of Sankofa. You talk about that in the book and the definition of that is an African word. It is not taboo to fetch what is at risk of being left behind. It is not taboo to fetch what is at risk of being left behind. That idea, I had, to, I had to research, I had to study, I had to think about that because how important, how important is it for us to not only delve deeper into our history, but not to forget our history and to push past February 28th? That is exactly what it is. I mean, Sankofa isn't just a word, it embodies a spirit. Mm -hmm. And it's a spirit for history. It's a spirit for storytelling. It means going back to the past to find the best of the past, to bring the best of the past forward, right? It's um, studying the work of, of Toni Morrison or Frederick Douglass or, and not only on, on, in a cursory way, it's like really trying to dig into their words and see how we can apply them to our own life and uh, take their philosophies and apply them to our own lives and, and move forward to a better future. So that spirit of Sankofa, and I sign every book in the spirit of Sankofa because that um, philosophy is just so powerful for me. It keeps me going. You know, sometimes this history can get, um, you know, you could get pessimistic reading of some of these stories, right? But that spirit of Sankofa is like trying to make sense of it, trying to bring the best of the past forward. Um, to move into a better future. So I love it as well, and that really keeps me going. I think what James Baldwin said to be black or to is to be in a constant state of rage. Yeah. And it, it, talk to me about that as well. When you are studying this and you are learning these stories that were essentially buried, right? Mm. How, do you, how do you not become enraged? I think you uh, have to balance hope and despair because James Baldwin said that, you know, you're going to be enraged, but he also said, know from whence you came. If you know from whence you came, there's no limit to where you can go. So he kind of had that balance where he was looking at, you know, the contradictions of American society and, and really digging really hard into race. But then he also had this undying hope as well for, for this better future. So I think that we always have to balance the hope with the despair at the same time. Does learning more about these stories, do you feel like that gives you hope? I think there are parts of it that, that give me hope for sure. Um, you know, to, to learn how people persevered, to learn about the resiliency of black people, to learn about um, just the brilliance of black people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why, you know, these efforts to ban black history, they're, they're never going to work because black history is so brilliant. It's like trying to use your thumb to block the sun. I mean, it's just too brilliant. It's going to keep coming through, right? Yeah. So um, those efforts aren't going to work. However, um, you do learn about, you know, a lot of the, the atrocities that have happened to black people in America. Um, and, you know, so, I mean, again, you, you can, it's, it's like a pendulum swinging back and forth. I mean, you could sway one way, but then you have to just remember the resiliency and the hope and the, uh, the brilliance of black people at the same time and just really try to balance those stories uh, within yourself. Yes, yes, I agree. Um, in the, I think this may be the final chapter of the book, you say no single narrative 
has a monopoly on truth. I, that's another one I have to reread. No single narrative has a monopoly on truth. Another just profound part that had me thinking, thinking a lot, right? Yeah. Um, how, how do you explain that? Well, if I, if I think about, you know, black people and the, and the fullness of the black experience, I think a lot of times that black people have had to shrink themselves. People think blackness is, you could buy it off a shoe rack or, um, you know, there's this uh, idea of a narrow black culture, but black people have been everything, right? So, uh, you know, there's, there's more than one version of black history. So I try to include in this book just a range of black thought, a range of black experiences, the, the fullness of black humanity, right? And, you know, people who disagree with each other, um, people who are on the same page, it's not just um, a story of people who thought one way, way, right? So, I mean, I get into, for instance, debate, the debate between uh, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington, who had varying views on how to move forward as black people, and really dive into that. Um, you know, so I, I just wanted to bring the fullness of the, the black experience and say, hey, you know, there's, you need to look at all these books, too, and then figure out what you think out of all these diverse opinions and perspectives mm -hmm. and uh, find your own truth in that way. So that was my goal there. Yeah, wonderful. And then another note is, uh, so this is more of a passage. It says, rereading James Baldwin, an astute observer of how the past intersects with the present, I came across this quote. To accept one's past, one's history is not the same as drowning it. It mm -hmm. is learning how to use it. An invented past can never be used. It cracks and crumbles under the pressures of life, like clay in a season of drought. And then you go on to say, we certainly shouldn't drown in our turbulent past, but we should always be mindful of the truth. Two easy stories of endless glory are almost always fabricated. One of the greatest uses of history is to understand the present as an effect caused by the past. Mm. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, yeah, we we're quoting Baldwin a lot, but he said we're trapped in history and history is trapped in us. And um, a lot of historians don't like to delve into, like, from, you, you'll notice in a lot of history books, they stop at, like, the 1970s. So I wanted to actually, in the last chapter of the book, I put myself in the book mm -hmm. and talk about myself as living through historic moments uh, as a black man, like, having these experiences, right? Everything from, uh, you know, black people who were firefighters in 9-11 to um, what other historic moments? I, I mean, I wrote about moments from our time, the 1980s, I wrote right. about, you know, and, and beyond. So I think that um, for me, it was about tying past to present. You know, how do you connect these stories? How do you connect the dots of the black experiences? Uh, you know, you could go all the way back from 1920, 30, 40. I mean, there's, there's connections there, right, to the black freedom struggle. There's connections to individual experiences and how uh, black people have seen themselves in the world and existed in America. So I really wanted to tie all that together so that we could feel this history and understand that we are part of something greater than ourselves and something that goes back much further than we are now. Yeah. You, I mean, you also talk about like living through uh, President Obama being elected. I talk about living through the murder of Trayvon Martin. Absolutely. Um, and those, those various things that we all can remember, which is an interesting perspective because we don't think of those as historical. I don't think we have come to think of those as historical events just yet, but they, but they have already shaped history. Absolutely, and, and they really do connect to, uh, you know, what's happened before in terms of uh, just the things that have been done to black people. If you think about it, a Trayvon Martin connecting back to, uh, you know, lynching atrocities and you have uh, Michael Brown's body just laying in the, in the hot sun for however many hours that was. I think it was a few hours he was laid out. And, you know, I connect that to the past and just like see how far have we come in this freedom struggle and how much farther do we have to go. So, you know, a lot of people stayed away from that. I wanted to dive right into it and just give my perspective on it and uh, my opinion on it as well and really make the book personal and not just a, a so detached of a history read to where you can't relate to it. So right. I really wanted to accomplish that. That is a goal of mine. But I love that you also talk about the importance of humanity. You talk about how this isn't just about telling stories of black history, but it is about remembering that we are still 99.9% .9 the same beneath the surface of our skin. Yeah, I think a lot of people miss that. I mean, we have to, uh, I think we have to get into the particulars of the black experience, like absolutely, and um, really dive into that. But I don't see a lot of people connecting us, you know, as this great chain of humanity 
And, um, you know, that's something that I really wanted to do always talking about race and whether it be racism or, or whatever I'm talking about, but never losing sight of our common humanity at the same time. And that uh, speaks again to that balance of hope and despair, right? You got to have a double vision, I think, to be able to do both. And I think a lot of times people, um, they, they, I see why they do it too, because I mean, for so long we had these monumental histories that uplifted, you know, these founding father figures in our history uh, and just really downplayed the things that they did. So now you kind of have this uh, coming full circle of like a critical history, right? The, the 1619 projects of the yeah. world that are very necessary to counterbalance these monumental histories that overlooked everything. But for me, it's more about I, I want to tell the, the critical stories, but also stay connected to that humanity at the same time. So I, I really thread that throughout the whole book and, and I always circle back around to that. You know, uh, well, here's another one I highlighted. The brute reality is that those in power will always seek to control the historical narrative which in America has typically fallen somewhere on a scale of whitewash to white supremacy, depending on the era. Uh, with projects like the 1619 Project, your, this book uh, as well, what would you tell the person who sees the retelling of history as a threat? Yeah, that's a, I, I think that uh, history has power. It, it has power, so people know that it has power, and that's why they want to control the narrative, and that's been true throughout time. So, uh, you know, people seeing history as a threat, um, it, it can be a threat if wielded, you know, in, in, in that way, but history can also bring us to truth. It can also bring us to understanding. It can also bring us to, uh, you know, common ground. It can also bring us to, uh, you know, the places that we need to go, I think, to connect us. Um, so. I think history can, can go either way, right? So I think it, it can be a threat and it can be wielded uh, in, in such a way to where, um, you know, it, it's going to speak more to inhumanity than, than humanity. So I, I think for me, it's about choosing, you know, how do I use history for good instead of using it, um, you know, just to highlight narratives that are gonna keep America in this light of exceptionalism and continuous progress, that's really not what it was. History swings back and forth like a pendulum. Yeah. And, um, you know, I really wanted to highlight that. So, you know, for me as a black woman reading this book, it felt very much like the history book I've always wanted to, to have, to read, to learn more about my history, my ancestors. But for the non-black people reading this book, book what do you hope they take away? I think for, for black people, you know, again, I, I want you to look at this book and see yourself, but I also, in the book I wrote about how even if you're not black, I want you to see yourself as well. And if you don't see yourself in these stories, why don't you see yourself in these stories, right? Because you're not connecting then to black humanity, which has been the problem all along, is whenever, you know, you see a Michael Brown and you don't, you don't, you connect more to the, uh, you know, police officer who murdered him more than Michael Brown, right? When you look back to these stories of, of enslavement and you don't connect to those emotionally, you don't connect to the, the visceral realities when, you know, these people told you, the, the stories have been told, they wrote their own books. And, um, you know, I want you to see yourself in, in, in the brilliance. I mean, I want you to see your humanity. I want you to connect to the tears, the smiles, the uh, triumphs, the failures, all of it, uh, you know, of black people. So I think the goal is the same for, for anybody reading this book. And, uh, you know, if you don't connect to that, I, I, I question why you don't connect to that, right? You're not connecting yeah. to yourself. Wow. I love that. You know, my last question is, what makes this book different than any other book? Well, nobody named Jermaine Fowler has ever wrote a book before. You so you know, I mean, but I mean, because the book really is personal to me. It's a really uh, embodiment of my experiences and my research and you know, my heart and soul went into this book, blood, sweat, and tears went into this book over the course really of, uh, you know, 15 years. And then uh, just pouring myself into this book over the past 10 months. Uh, really, I think you're going to feel that in the book. You're going to uh, get to know me in the book, but you're also going to learn black history in a way that you've never learned before, always connecting back to this idea of humanity, which I haven't seen done before either in the way that I've done it. So. Yes, it's well, it's, it's wonderful. So thank you. Uh, kudos again to you. This is it's really beautiful. I know the audience has some questions, um, and we're going to have, we have the mic that's right there, um, so we're just asking anyone who has a question to line up, 
right there and uh, talk to the mic. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, what, if any, role did Black Joy play um, in your research of this history and for you as an archivist? Yeah, I think Black Joy is important, and I, I really appreciate the focus, you know, of uh, our generation in focusing on Black Joy because I think sometimes we can get lost in, in those stories of oppression. Um, so for me, it was about looking at black brilliance. You know, I dedicated a whole part of the book to, um, you know, black people, whether it be the fight for democracy or black inventiveness. Um, a lot of people don't know that between 1870 and 1920, black people uh, had 50,000 inventions, second only to uh, German and English immigrants. So these are the things that I wanted to highlight in the book to say, okay, you know, how black people succeeded, how black people triumphed uh, throughout history as opposed to only stories of uh, oppression. So I wanted to really balance that. So that's the role that they played for me in the book. Can you come to the mic, please? I, I learned something because I learned American history. I learned uh, why history and black history. So my question is, uh, what's the difference between the uh, uh, community, the white community and black community? What's the difference? Oh, uh, well, the history uh, is, is the difference and, um, you know, the, the idea of whiteness really was invented in America and Virginia um, in terms of, um, you look back to Bacon's Rebellion and, and you know, people coming together to, uh, it was really, a, a lot of it was a class struggle in America to begin with, but then, you know, those in power said, okay, we, we can't have this, so we have to invent this term whiteness, which was put into law. And then, uh, you know, it's not that prejudice didn't exist before then, I mean, people have, uh, had divisions over ethnic, ethnicity and uh, you know tribalism and nationalism throughout all of human history. However, this idea of white and black really took form in America, and uh, you know we've been battling with that ever since. You know this idea of blackness and whiteness and, and trying to figure it out. Uh, I read some book, and um, my friend told me said that as a white community and black community is uh, such a different. Uh, yeah, they said the black community is a drug, more drug, and alcohol, education level lower, lowerly. Are you agree or disagree? Well, I, I think that person is really continuing on in the, in the racism and the racist ideas that, you know, have been perpetuated because, I mean, those are stereotypes, uh, you know, about the black community that are untrue, right? So I think that person definitely needs to read the book and, and learn the fullness of the black experience. <laughs> Second question. Uh, you write the book uh, because everybody do something have a purpose. What's your motivation? What's your motive, uh, more, more motivation? You write the book. You, this is your um, passion and hobby. It's it's definitely a passion. Uh, you know, I, I look at it as my calling, and uh, I look at it as a sacred duty to educate people on you know, overlooked history, uh, the stories of the historically unheard, as I call them. So that is my mission, and that's uh, what I do in, in all my work and, and everything is, is try to highlight those stories. Thank you. Thank you. I have a Louisville question. Um, so I haven't read your book. I don't know if you've included black Louisville history in it, so that's one if you want to tell us any part of that story. And also just like your take on our shared humanity and our shared hometown and how the black history of our community can be made part of our shared humanity. Here. Yeah, yeah, I told the story uh, of Henry Bibb, um, who was from Shelby County, he was enslaved in Kentucky, and uh, he came through Louisville. Uh, he was coming along the Underground Railroad trying to make it up north, and uh, you know, he had a terrible experience here. He had his wife, and she was sold away from him and he uh, said that Louisville was like coming through a pit of vipers blindfolded because you know slavery was just so prevalent here. There were um, 2,500 to 4,000 uh, people shipped down south a year in Louisville and I think the grand contradiction here is that uh, you know you have the slavery markers here that says you know that slavery was kind of shunned here so even that's whitewashed right it's saying that slavery was shunned here but you had so many enslaved people moving through Louisville so I really try to highlight that contradiction here and to highlight, um, or rather, 
to connect that history to the larger national history in terms of slavery. But there, there's a lot of stories here that I'd like to dig more into. And as far as the, the larger human project, I mean, the, again, that's my goal, the idea that we are 99.9% .9 similar, and I think that we often highlight our differences more than we highlight our similarities. So, um, you know, it is hard to do sometimes with, with so much division, but I really always try to connect to that and uh, let that be my guiding light, even when I study these harder histories and try to bring those to light. So, I love the podcast. I love the music. Don't ever change the music on the podcast. <laughs> and it really got me through some hard times in the pandemic and the racial struggles after George Floyd. I wondered what's the difference for you in preparing for the podcast, the spoken word, and then writing the book, the written word? Oh, that's a great question. That's a great question. Uh, the podcast, well, I'll start with the book. The book, I think, is much broader to where the podcast, I'm able to go into uh, particular stories. Uh, the book, I was able to really take a more thematic approach uh, and still add those particular stories in, but really tie those two larger themes. Um, so the, the podcast is a little more narrow in its focus, uh, but the book really allowed me to really um, expand my vision and expand my view um, of black history. And, uh, you know, I, I think it was a beautiful transition, but still able to bring some of that podcast storytelling into the book, which I think you'll find as well. The book, definitely. Uh, <laughs> because there were, my publisher was a very timely book they wanted to come out with quickly. So, um, you know, I was talking to some other people who have written history books and usually they get like two years, sometimes even three years, and I had to write this book in 10 months. So, uh, you know, I, nobody saw me for, for a year like trying to write this book. <laughs> So I was going to ask about, I imagine you just had, you know, a plethora of information, like so much, probably had like four, five books worth. So I just wonder what was the um, selection process like in order to narrow down what was in the book and then to follow that up, um, even though congratulations on releasing this book. Do you yeah. have an idea for like another project or something that's fun? That? Yeah, yeah. Um, I really, whew, I mean, I just started digging. I... I mean, you, if you saw like the office in my house and the amount of books I have like stacked to the ceiling, I mean, I really started with black authors, um, you know, going back to, you know, the W.E.B. Du Bois of, of history, going back to uh, Alfonso Schomburg, who has a, a library, uh, well, the, the New York library, uh, they have a section that was dedicated, you know, to him because uh, He's somebody also who almost lost his wife because he had so many books. He's like, the book's got to go or I'm leaving. I mean, I, I kind of feel like him sometimes and, and, and digging in these stories and, um, you know, really connect to that. Um, so for me, it's just getting as much information as I can, surrounding myself with these books, these papers, and, and digging into these databases and then seeing how I can tie that to my mission and themes that I have in terms of uh, highlighting overlooked stories and, you know, tying this all into this theme of humanity at the same time. Once again, I want to say congratulations on your book. Uh, as an educator in our school system, uh, I noticed that you said you came to the library to get some information that, yep. that wasn't taught to you while you was in school. Uh, what would you like to say to the teachers back then and say to the teachers now how to teach the information that you wrote about in the book? And the last question is, how could that book be put into our school system for our kids to learn from that? Yeah, I, I mean, for me, I think the way that history should be taught is to... Uh, I mean, we shouldn't be banning books, that we should actually be doing the opposite of banning books to give kids all the books, you know, really amongst all different perspectives and then teaching them how to think their way through these books and then come up with their own perspective. So guiding them, you know, through these different perspectives and whether that be black history, uh, you know, and I, I included just so many different perspectives in my book, so I would just give them you know, two different schools of thought. I mean, I, I just use uh, W.E.B. Du Bois versus Booker T. Washington. One was more conservative, one was more radical in their thinking. Okay, well, read both of these books, and then I want you to synthesize that information and then think for yourself to uh, come to your own conclusions. So um, for me, that's, that's the starting point in how I would educate in history. Um, and remind me again, what was the second part of your question? How could we get that book? Into our school system. I, I think it's going to take like everybody here, you know, making sure like make the phone calls and uh, you know rally together to to get it to get it in there. So I, I appreciate you. Thank you. Hi, Jermaine. Thank you for Thanks. being here. Um, my question is, how do we get people to understand that Black history is American history that has been kept from all of us? 
And if we can achieve that, what is possible? Yeah, I think we have to think about what, what do we lose by keeping these black stories segregated and separated out of the larger American story. I think that, um, you know, when you don't include black history, American history becomes soulless. You know, it doesn't see itself. It doesn't see its moral depths. Um, you, you can't see that unless you look at black history. So um, you're only seeing one part of the story. You're only seeing one side of the coin. So I think that's what needs to be highlighted. You know, what are we losing by not including these stories into the larger narrative of American history? Any more questions? Hi. Uh, I look forward to reading your book. I really have a couple of uh, factoids, sort of. One a gentleman asked about Louisville. I don't know how many people know, but the minstrelsy or the minstrel show and the, the white doing blackface mm -hmm. may have originated in Louisville, Kentucky. Wow. And I've been reading about that lately. I think it had something to do with the riverboat culture. Hmm. So uh, a negative um, for our city. But um, uh, the other thing was on whitewashing. Uh, I don't know, again, if I haven't read your book yet, um, but one of our America's great exports is uh, the cowboy western. Absolutely. You know? And look at them. I mean, we watched them, you know, as kids in black and white. Mm -hmm. and, but we, we know so many, you know, different variations. Everybody's always... And all around the world, they love it. Well, about 30% of cowboys were black. Yeah. And I don't know the percentage, but a, a significant percentage, of course, were Hispanic. So. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. Just um, throw it's, it out there. It, it's across the board, 15 to 25% of George Washington's militia was black. I mean, so you have all <laughs> these facts that, again, black people excluded from the story. So mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that. My wife asked a question, so I have to also. <clears throat> okay. I can't tell her to the best of me. Uh, and, and I don't know, obviously I haven't read the book either, just got it tonight. Um, but do you look at all at the role of the church in, in some of uh, what's happened in our country? Well, I, I do talk about the, the black church in the book and the role that it played in the black freedom movement. Uh, the black freedom struggle is a place, one of the only places that people could gather to uh, talk about social issues and its role as, um, you know, you didn't have these charities and these different things that you have now to, you know, people didn't have access to that. So it was the black church who was really uh, working on the Underground Railroad. I mean, getting people buried even where there was no funeral service for people. So I really tried to tie back to that church history in, in a section of my book uh, just to highlight the role of the black church in the black community. That too, yeah, I talk about that as well, yeah, yeah, um, you know, Christian nation, uh, and then, you know, passage of the Bible even, and ripped out uh, to give to enslaved preachers, you know, anything that talked about freedom, anything that talked about, um, you know, escaping, or, or anything that would have, you know, sparked that idea in their mind to rise up, I mean, so there's a, a large history of the white church um, really doing terrible things, you know, especially during slavery, but even beyond that, and uh, you know, that, that's a history I look at in the book as well. I just want to say that this is amazing. My aunt invited me tonight, and I'm just blown away. I wish I would have known I would have invited more people. So yeah. um, thank you for this I, great work. I appreciate it, man. Um, I'm also an educator. I teach at Newburgh Middle School. And I've done everything that I can. I've only been teaching for four years, but I'm trying to get my students to really buy into their heritage and culture. Um, and it just seems like there's a big disconnect. And some of that could be due to immaturity. I mean, they're young. It's yeah, of course. But I know for me, I wasn't taught a lot about black history. And as I started to discover it, going to college and stuff, I feel like it was like a rebirth or liberation yeah, within my yeah. identity. Yeah. And so I just wonder, do you feel like if we could get more black history in school, would that help with the students forming a better sense of identity, who they are? Because I think subconsciously, they don't see the importance because systematically or just, I don't know, it just doesn't seem as if 
it's connected to their identity. Like they hear it, they know it, they hear a lot of the same stories, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, but I just really am trying to find a way to connect this to their identity so they can have a sense of pride, a sense mm -hmm. of who they are. And so just what are your, what is your advice on helping me with these students to do that? Yeah, I, I appreciate you, man. I mean, you're you're really doing the real work that uh, you know. I, I, I mean, everybody, please give us a hand. Seriously, seriously. Um, you know, I, I think for me, it's it's been the storytelling. The storytelling. One of the greatest compliments I get, like it doesn't matter if I get any accolades or anything, is somebody saying like, "My 13 year old listens to the podcast, man. They're really engaged with it because to hold, I mean, as you know, to hold the attention of a 12, 13, 14 year, I mean, it's very difficult, right? So, um. You know, I think that that storytelling, I don't know how we, how do we get that in schools to where we can uh, bring that, that aspect, that bring the history to life aspect, because right now they're just getting it, you know, in these textbooks and where you, you have your curriculum model that you have to follow and, you know, it's got to be point A, point B factual. Um, I don't, students really aren't connecting to that, right? It's just like passing a test. So um, I think we have to transform the whole way we teach history. But for you, I think it's like what, what additional resources maybe can you bring in the classroom to try to connect them because it is so important for black students to connect to that, you know, identity aspect, to have the pride of, of, of the culture and the ancestors and to be able to connect to that. And it's a sad reality that a lot of them are because they just kind of see it as this factual history that they, they don't connect to, right? So uh, for me, it's the storytelling, but uh, I definitely would love to connect with you, give you a card, man, and we try to figure it out uh, together, you know? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and just to, yeah, that was, I mean, that was a wonderful question, and I will say everything he said was so spot on because reading this book made me feel a lot more empowered. When you know your history, and I, I can't remember the quote, but um, when you know your history, a, a people who know their history, they know their purpose, yeah. and, and it helps really propel you forward. So the other educator who mentioned getting this book in schools, I understand. I understand why. Now, again, I don't know if a 13-year-old could digest it. Yeah, I might have to come <laughs> out mean, with a younger yeah, reader's I feel, edition I feel like of that if book. we could get a, uh, a version for younger kids, right? But, uh, you know, obviously, but every story in this book, it'll help you find somebody to identify with. That's what I felt myself in this book is identifying with people I had never heard of yeah. versus the people we are taught about. So, I mean, I can't thank you enough for writing well, it. Well, thanks for reading. Incredible. I appreciate everybody. Yeah. Seriously, I really do. This is our last question. Congratulations uh -oh. on your book. <clears throat> um, having gone through all of the stories and preparing your book and, and getting everything together as you have, um, one thing that I, that I respect deeply is that it gives you a different kind of context for what's happening today. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, as I read it, I'd love to have some thought from you to sort of linger in the back of my mind about what you see happening today whether it be movements among young people uh, or just various movements in our uh, varying communities that gives you hope or optimism for potentially seeing some of the changes that you want to see? Well, uh, I was thinking about this earlier and like, you know, while adults are arguing over what history to teach, like a lot of kids are just like on TikTok, just telling these untold stories like right now, right? So, I mean, they're, they're actually digging into the history already themselves a lot of times and trading these stories amongst themselves. So I, I see that so much, uh, you know, through social media. Um, you know, I, I'm always inspired by, by the young people, uh, you know, the, the movements that they have going in terms of, uh, you know, social justice and, um, you know, really just trying to see change in the world. So, um, you know, that's something that I always try to connect to, you know, with the past to present and, and just trying to connect with the younger generation with these stories the best that I can. Uh, and, you know, what I really try to connect is meet them where they are, whether that be through social media or, um, you know, wherever that they are, that's where I try to go to connect with, with younger people so that I can kind of be, be there with them as they try to move everything forward. So I appreciate the question. Oh, one more. Okay. I, this is not exactly a question. It's a, it's a comment that I'm hoping you'll share your thoughts about. So I, in this Black History Month, I have been thinking about this a lot, which is my own... <laughs> Forgive me. White is a, where were my people when terrible things were happening? Yes, there are a lot of white heroes, including Anne Braden, a wonderful Louis Villian. We could think about who some of the hero heroines are. But what I really mean is when I think about the the la the integration of of um, of um, 
Little Rock School, the lack of integration, what was going on in Mississippi with James Meredith, what was going on here and there all over the country, where were we? Where were my people? Yes, we were afraid. Yes, we, were, we didn't want to be ostracized. Yes, we can put our fingers on all of that kind of thing. But really, in the end, where were we? That we were at home watching this on TV or covering our ears or denialism. That's a great word. Where were my people? And I just wanted your thoughts about that. I mean, if I'm being honest, I think that's a question, uh, a core question that every white person has to look in the mirror and ask themselves, right? That's a question I couldn't answer, but um, I think that's very, that that's going to, if you do, if anybody who is questioning in that way, it does that and really starts to look, really dig into your own history as I look into my own history in this book, then I think that you would find the answer to that question. Really? Yeah, I think so. I appreciate you. Okay. We do, we have one more. <laughs> so you, you started with me, you're going to end with me. So, so as, um, as we move forward uh, and what the Juneteenth Jubilee Commission is doing, we've heard a lot about how are we going to be able to get it into the school system. I'm a product of being taught black history in Jefferson County Public Schools. How did it happen? My teacher went against the grain. It was the Ann Elmores of the world. It was the um, uh, Mr. Greens of the world. Mr. Green made and typed his own black history book. Wow. And that's what he taught us from. Beautiful. Beautiful. Class of 73, Shawnee. But that's- he had, he had to, didn't he? Uh, he had to. You know, and, and he made us learn. They made us learn our history so that it's, it's us today that are trying to carry on, you today that are trying to carry on. Praying for you, young brother. Thank you so much for bringing this. But as we move forward, this is a bigger beast than what we really realize mm -hmm. because it's got to go national. And fortunately for us, um, we, have the, we have a person who is sitting on the education committee <clears throat> right here in the district, uh, Congressman McGarvey mm -hmm. is on that committee. And so it needs to go national to the legislation mm -hmm. as well as to KEA who is on board, but we've gotta be able to get it into the system when the books are being written. Absolutely. And so it is mm -hmm. a huge, huge process. So if anybody is willing to work with the commissioners on doing that, Please reach out to us. I'm here tonight so that we can be able to do that. But there are other creative ways to be able to teach in the classroom. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you.